Hey, welcome. My name is Chase, one of the pastors here. Super excited for what we get to do and talk about today. We're in a series that we started last week called One Hit Wonders, and uh, this is week two. So if you weren't here in week one, here's what we're doing. We're taking a look at what, what I would call maybe some of the top Bible verses out there, some of the, the most popular Bible verses. Uh, maybe if you, if you don't know Jesus, never been to church, you've probably heard of one of the verses that we might talk about over the next few weeks, like John 3.16, for God so... Yeah, so like it doesn't matter if you've been to church your whole life, never been to church, you maybe have heard that at some point in your life. We're going to talk about verses like that. We're also going to talk about verses that, that I think, I'll say it this way, they pack a punch. They pack a punch that, that just this one little verse has a lot of power packed into it. And as we go about our time together through this series, what I want to do is not only do I want to help teach you a little bit about God's word, but I want to help you memorize God's word because I think it's really important that we put God's word into our mind and our heart because it'll help us live better lives. I really believe that with all that I am. So to make it easier for you, every week you get a little cool piece of paper that looks just like this, a little card that you can take home that'll have that one hit wonder, that verse that we're going to cover. It'll have the main verse on there for you. So you can take it home, put it in your car, put it in your wallet, put it on your nightstand, put it on a mirror, whatever you need to do with it so you can help memorize God's word and look at it and, and do a little bit more throughout the week. My goal is not that you would just memorize words. My hope is that you would remember the power that is packed within each one of these one-hit wonders. So if you're ready to do that today, would you just say, I'm ready? Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're here. Hey, I want to remind you, you're in the 11 o'clock service, and I just want to say hi to anyone and everyone that is joining us on Facebook. We're so glad to have you. We do a Facebook Live at our 11 o'clock service. So if, if, you are never, if you are never here, if you are ever absent from church and have to be home or sick or out of town or something, you want to join us on Facebook Live, I don't know how you do it, but it's on there somewhere. So I don't know. Facebook. Go to Facebook. There you go. And if you don't know what Facebook is... Ask your grandparents or grandkids. Even my grandma knows Facebook, so you, you should get to it. It's a good thing. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys for joining us here today. We're excited. I also want to remind you, uh, just, just a little caveat, just so you understand this, that sometimes I, just, I think it's important to keep this in front of us, that we're, we have two services. And maybe you didn't know that. Maybe that's not a big deal to you. But if you were here before we had two services, sometimes you might look around and say, why did we go to two services? <laughs> you know, like, look at all these. This is front row. No one wanted to sit this close to me this morning. Like, I don't understand, right? And you might be wondering that or ever wonder that. And I just want to remind you of the reason why we went to two services. We want to continue to provide more opportunity for more people to hear more about Jesus. And over the past, I don't know how many months, three months that we've done this, we have seen more opportunities come. We've seen more people come and hear more about Jesus. And, and just so you know, there was a fun, excited 915 crowd here this morning. And so my hope is that your energy level is above theirs. Can we do that? Okay, now you're scaring me. Let's, let's bring it back a little bit. All right. All right. Okay. All right. No, I'm excited for you guys. I'm really excited for today and, and what we're going to get to do today. Today, we're going to the very first book and the very first verse in this thing we call the Bible for our one-hit wonder. It's Genesis 1-1. It says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a short, simple, sweet verse but I believe there's a lot of power packed into it. And last week, I tried to make it really easy with your memory verse. Anybody remember last week's memory verse? What is it? You guys, you are so good. Man, your parents and grandparents would be so proud. You memorized the Bible. Anybody remember where it was found? John 11, 35. Some of you are like, they said it so quick. I didn't even have a chance. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. We added a few more words today, but it's pretty simple. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I believe we're going to pack something really powerful together here today. Last week, we were reminded some things about Jesus. I said that Jesus is, loves me, and Jesus is like me, and that Jesus is my Lord if we would put our faith and trust in him. And since I was on that theme, I thought this week we should say, God is, fill in the blank. It's kind of thinking through that. And in case you care, maybe you don't, but I get to share it with you anyway. My goal and my desire every time I get a chance to preach, every time I get a chance to stand up here with God's word, is to help Make it simple for you is, is I like to say it this way. I like to, to do a little spam. Say, what's that, Chase? What's that, Chase? Thank you for asking. I came up with an acronym one time when I was trying to figure out how do I approach scripture when I get to preach. And I came up with the acronym SPAM. And first of all, it's simple. I'm always trying to, to simplify things. I think the best communicators are people that can make the complicated simple. So I always want to simplify it for you. Because sometimes God's word might seem a little confusing. So if we can make it simple. The second thing, P, I want to make it passionate. If I'm not excited and passionate about what I'm talking about, guess what? 
you're not going to care what I'm talking about. So I want to be passionate about what I have to say. Third thing is, A, I want to be applicable. I want you to be able to apply this to your life. I believe God's word is not something we just read. It's something that we put into practice in our life. And I really believe it is life transforming if you would allow it to be. So simple, passionate, applicable. And then the last one is memorable. My goal is always for you guys to be able to walk out of here. And if it's simple enough, hopefully you'll be able to mem- mem- remember what we talked about. And so this week, this, we're going to talk about God is blank. And I'm going to give you four truths about God that we get from this one short, sweet, and simple verse, Genesis 1-1. Are you ready? All right. Some of you are, and I am too. In the beginning, God. The first truth I see from Genesis 1-1 is this, that God is eternal. God is eternal. And I think this is a really important truth for us to understand in our faith. It starts, the beginning of all creation starts with God already there. I find that kind of interesting. And as we look at Genesis 1-1, I found myself flipping to John 1 often. So we're not going to go back and forth between Genesis 1 and John 1, because they both start with the same three words, in the beginning. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. And now if we jump to John 1, I think it says it a little more interesting here. It says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. Now the word is Jesus. He's talking about the word. He's he's talking about Jesus. And if you were here last week, we talked about the letter John was written by a guy named John. You guys are so smart. Written by a guy named John. And John gives us his purpose. He said, here's why I'm writing this letter. So that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that you would remember that and you would continue to believe in him. I want to prove to you that he's the Messiah. So he starts his letter off by saying, in the beginning was Jesus. Jesus already existed. And he was with God at the beginning, and he actually was God and is God. Isn't that kind of cool? That, that God already existed. God is eternal. I think this is an important truth for us to know today. God is before all things and above all things. He's the first and last, the alpha and the omega. He has always been. He will always be. Now, God is difficult to define. I often say we can describe God But to define God, when you define something, I think you end up putting limits on something. So we're trying to define a limitless God and trying to put limits on something that has no limits. God has always been. That can, it's not always easy for us to understand because we can't easily understand something that has no beginning and no ending. At least I can't easily understand something that has no beginning and no ending. It's hard to wrap our mind around it. But Genesis 1 doesn't give us a whole lot of specifics. It just says, in the beginning, God. Well, where did he come from? He didn't. He's timeless. When did he begin? He didn't. I don't understand. Join the club. (laughs) I'm just going to be honest with you. But but as I was thinking about this, and like, you can't just tell him God is eternal. You'll never understand it. Let's move on to the second point. Like, that's not enough. And I was reminded of this this phrase, this this sentence, this quote I heard a long time ago. I've heard it from many different people, so I'm just going to say that it was me that came up with it. Um, there, I'm just kidding. There's a lot of people that attribute to it, and a lot of people have adjusted along the way, but this, I think, is really helpful for us because there is a lot about God that we cannot understand. And, and this, this phrase popped in my mind. It said this. It says, if God were small enough for us to understand, he would not be big enough for us to worship. I think there's some power in that phrase. Now, I add it this way. I say, if God were small enough for us to completely understand, Because I think God's word and out in creation teaches us a lot about who God is. There are a lot of things we can understand about God. But if he were small enough that you and I could completely understand him, I don't think he'd be worthy and big enough for us to worship. Think of it this way. I I thought of the mystery of God is what brings about some, some awesomeness about God. It's the mystery of God that brings about worship to God. And it makes us say, oh, wow, that's amazing. Think about sports. Maybe if you're paying attention uh, to sports and you like sports, the NFL um, playoffs are on right now. And what often happens if you're watching football, um, like me, what often happens is someone will make a catch that was an impossible catch to make. And what we find ourselves doing is we say, wow, that was amazing. How in the world did he do that? Right? We find ourselves, we are in awe of someone that can do something that we cannot do. We're in awe when someone can do something that we cannot explain or fully understand. We also flip it around the other way. When you get paid millions of dollars to catch a football and you don't catch a football, we all say, you had one job. (laughs) Catch the football. 
When, when, way, when they miss a catch that you and I can catch, we say, well, that's not impressive. Right? We get, we get frustrated. When they don't kick the ball through the field goal. <laughs> from 43 yards away to send a team to the playoffs that haven't been there in five years. Or to the next round of playoffs. If you don't know, I'm a big Bears fan. And so there's just was a, this was a sad last Sunday was a really sad, sad moment in my life. Here's my point. When we look and see someone do something that we can't fully understand and we couldn't do ourselves, that we say, that's incredible that they can do that. No one can do that. We, we are amazed at that. And I believe the same is true about God. When we look and see that God is eternal, he has no beginning and no ending. He is incredible. He's the alpha and the omega. He's before all things and beyond all things. He has always been. He always will be. Something inside of me goes, wow, that's amazing. That's awesome. So I think some of the mystery about God is actually can lead us to worship him and help us remember that he's big, so big, I can't fully comprehend it and fully understand it and fully get it. But that's what makes him so awesome and worthy of my praise. God is eternal. I can't fully explain it, but I believe it. And I see that there's something amazing about it. So we see this. We see God is eternal. But let me show you another truth I pull out of this very first verse of the very first book of the Bible. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God, and then it tells us what he did. God created. Not only is God eternal, but God is a creator. Now, I got stuck on this word in the last service. I got to just let you in on a little bit of this. Um, is it creator or creator? It's just a question I might have. Which, what do you say? Do some people really say creator? I got really stuck on it last time I said God is creator. And then every time I said it, people laughed. And then I got stuck and I couldn't say creator anymore. We all say creator, tour, but it's creator. And so I think it's a little fancier and I'm going to stick with creator. Is that all right? I don't care. Right there, it says that God is creator. He is the creator. He created all things. In First John, or sorry, in John 1, it says that God created everything through him, talking about Jesus, and nothing was created except through him. Again, New Testament, Old Testament, God is creator. John's purpose is to show us that Jesus is God, and he starts the whole letter off showing that Jesus has always existed with God, and as God, and God created everything through him. And I believe that this is an essential truth for us in the Christian faith. An essential truth. If you've been with us a while, there was a series we did. I think it was the question and answer series that we did. Um, where I talked about essentials versus non-essentials. That there are things in, in the Christian faith, things in the Bible that are very clear. God is very clear on. And we need to have unity on that. They're essentials to our faith. Let me give you an example. Jesus Christ, Son of God, crucified and risen for our salvation. That's an essential truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. Jesus Christ is an essential truth to our faith. Saved by faith, not by works. We don't earn our way to heaven. We don't earn our way into a relation with God. We're saved through faith. That's an essential to the Christian faith. You, you follow? Follow? Nod your head a little bit. I can see, see, see. Okay. Should a Christian watch R-rated movies? Should a Christian drink any alcohol? I'm going to answer that's a non-essential. That means two Christians can have different opinions on something, still love each other, still sit next to each other in church, and be okay about it, and still be okay. Two Christians that love Jesus with all their heart, soul, and mind can disagree on non-essentials. You understand what I'm saying? Follow me? Okay. God the creator is an essential to our faith. Because he was not created. He is the creator. We don't worship and serve creation. We worship and serve the creator. And in that thing, I said this, another phrase that is uh, a quote, goes way back. It says this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Meaning this, in the essential things of the Christian faith, we must be united. Jesus Christ. The only way we have to be united around that, have to be in agreement upon that. In non-essentials, liberty, there's freedom. We're okay. We give grace to people that don't believe just like us because that's okay. God's word hasn't spoken very clearly to it or, or hasn't, there's, not a, there's not a defined thing that we need to pull away from that and that there's a little bit of freedom in that. But in all things, charity, in all things, love and grace that we need to give no matter what. 
And I would say that God created the universe is pretty clear all throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus even references it when he speaks, talking about God as the creator. I think it's essential to our faith that he was created, or he is the creator, not he was created. Now let me be very clear for just a moment, because you're talking about in the beginning, God created. And, and I have to say this. God the creator is an essential. How long ago he created and how exactly that creation came about, I believe, is a non-essential. Meaning, you could be sitting next to someone right now that believes differently than you about this situation and this topic. Is it thousands of years old or is it billions of year old? years old? Billions of years old. I, don't, I think it's a non-essential. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there theories that better reflect what the Bible says about this topic? Let me, that was a bad question. Hang on. Are there, are there theories? Yeah, that made sense. Why did no one answer? <laughs> I wrote it down, right? I think I read it, right? Are there theories that better reflect what the Bible says on this topic? Yeah, there are some theories that better reflect what God's word has to say about it. Y yes. Do people have good reasoning for believing what they believe on this topic? Yeah. Okay, whew, that was an easier one. How about this? Is God's desire that there would be division and arguing and frustration and complaining and name-calling and lines drawn in the sand in the Christian faith over this topic? Yeah. No. Does it impact Christ crucified and risen from the dead? Does where we believe of how old the earth is impact our faith in Jesus? I don't think so. I think it's worth studying, sure. Do I have an opinion about it? Yes. Am I going to preach it to you? No. <laughs> no. Now, if you want to know what I think, I'll tell you. I've studied. I've spent some time in it. I, I thought it was like the coolest thing to study for the longest time. And then I was like, that doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> and I got over it. But I have an opinion. And guess what? I think my opinion's right or I wouldn't have had it. Right? If I thought, well, this is probably wrong, but I still believe it. That's silliness in my opinion, which I think is right. So anyway. <laughs> So if you want to know what I think about it, that'd be great. We can talk about it later. But I don't think that God's desire is for me to stand up here and preach an opinion to you or to preach something that he's not clear about. I believe God has called us to preach the gospel, to preach his word, to preach Jesus Christ crucified, to help you understand his word better and to teach non-essentials that we can have unity on. And I think that's really important. So, so I think it's important that we understand that God doesn't say in the beginning, 3 billion B.C., in the beginning, 4,000 B.C. No, he, he just we know this. In some time past, all that existed was God. And then, bam, he spoke the world into motion. He began to speak and create things. We see clearly that God is eternal and that God is the creator. This is clear and seen throughout the Bible, and I believe it's an important, essential truth for us today. Now, let's move on. What is that another truth that I think we can see from this one verse? In Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God is eternal. God created. He is the creator God. And then it says, He created the heavens and the earth. I think that shows us and reminds us and encourages us that God is powerful. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. The entire universe, he spoke into motion. By the power of his words, God created everything. Now, the way I grew up, I grew up Baptist, independent Baptist. I don't know why I got that tone, but that's how the people talk there. And when you would say something like, God is powerful, you'd hear in the back row, and they always had a real nice deep voice. They'd say, Amen. Now, you don't have to do that, but I'm just saying that that's what they would do. And, you know, so God is powerful. Amen. Oh, that was too many people at one time. I didn't, that scared me. <laughs> God is powerful. And I think that's a, an exciting truth for us to understand, an important truth. He spoke it all into existence. We think we're pretty awesome when we say, hey, Alexa, play my favorite radio song, right? Play, play my favorite Disney song. Oh, you wouldn't do that. Never mind. Play, play my favorite music and Justin Bieber starts playing over your seat, right? Like you think it's powerful when, when we, we like, I just spoke that song into existence. Like, no, you used Alexa. And God was doing all this before Alexa was around. It's Alexa, right? Yeah. I started thinking it was Alexis for a moment there and I just got real confused. Alexa. Alexa? Anyway, it doesn't matter. God spoke it all into existence. 
In John 1, you see this. It says that God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. And then it says that the word gave life to everything that was created. Not only did God create everything, he gave life to everything. God the creator is a powerful thing for us to understand. He created everything through Jesus. And this is a necessary truth for us today because through a relationship with this same Jesus, we have access to the same power in our lives. Last question. What is or was the greatest miracle to ever occur? Was it water to wine? That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Can you do that? No. Was it multiplication of loaves and fishes? I mean, some of us get real excited about that, right? It's like, man, God made this much food, that much food. That's awesome. Turned a grande combo into two grande combos, right? That's incredible. Maybe it was some of the healings. There were some pretty impressive healings. He parted the Red Sea. That's incredible. No, it's got to be Lazarus. He, we learned it last week. He brought Laz back from the dead. I'm sorry. He brought himself back from the dead. That's got to be the most... Re- I'll give you my opinion, which I think is right. The greatest miracle that ever occurred was in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Why? If God created the universe, then he can do whatever he pleases inside of that universe. Part the Red Seas, he created the seas. I'm sure he can split it apart. Loaves, fish, wine, water, he created it all. It's simple. Bringing someone back from the dead, he breathed life into them in the first place. So I think for us to understand this, this verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, brings about a power in our lives that we need to get and we need to remember about this. We don't just memorize, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. No, we remember that that makes, tells us that God is eternal, that God is the creator God, and that God is powerful. And the same power that brought the world into motion, I believe we have access to our, in our lives today. I think this is a great truth to rest on, that no matter what you're going through at this moment in time, That God is more powerful than any situation we find ourselves in. Sickness, death, broken or hurting relationships, addiction, money struggles, depression, anxiety, worry. God is bigger than it all. He is more powerful than it all. And he can help us through it all. When you're going through junk and you feel like you're, you're drowning, remember that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And that reminds us that we have a powerful God that we serve. It's not that God isn't big enough or isn't powerful enough to help us through. Oftentimes, it's it's our faith is weak. We don't really believe that we serve an eternal, creator, powerful God. But I think if we rest on this truth that he created and he is powerful, I think he can help us get through a lot of things. Paul Paul writes in in a letter, 2 Timothy, he writes in chapter 1, he says this, That is why I'm suffering as I am. He lists some reasons why he was suffering, some things that were going on in his life that were not awesome. He says, yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul is suffering. He's going through some junk and he says, I know who I have put my faith in. That's Jesus, who always has been, who always will be the first and the last. This Jesus, whom God created everything through. And I am convinced that he is able. He says, I know that he is powerful. I know that he is bigger than any suffering or sorrow or sickness or sadness that I am facing. Any fear. He is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What's that day? What he knows is that one day Christ will return. One day God, Christ is coming back. And he says, I know that I have I have." given this to God who is able to guard, protect my life. He says, I have entrusted my soul, my life, my everything to him. And I know that he is powerful enough to help me through what I'm going through right now. I think that that's a truth that we can pull out of in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth into our life today. Whatever you are facing right now, I want you to understand this. God can get you through it. God can help you whatever you're going through. He is bigger than your problems, than your suffering. He is able. He's powerful enough to guard my life, to get me through the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, the big and the small things in life. I know that my God is powerful. Now, there's one last truth that I want to share with you guys. 
And I got to be honest, it's not really from this first burst. Like, I could lie and say, I see this if you really read deep into it. But honestly, I think this verse sets up where I want to end. We learn that God is eternal, that God is creator, and that he is powerful. And then that verse sets up what comes next in Genesis. And I think the last truth that we need to understand is not only God is eternal, he's creator, and he's powerful, but God is personal. God is personal. If we look at how he created it all, at least what comes next in Genesis, we see that there is an order to it. There is a sequential order leading up to the high point, the pinnacle of all of his creation. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The very next verse says this, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Earth is formless and empty. Okay. So what comes next? He should form it. So God starts forming it. So the next step, he does that. He says, then God said, let there be light. And it said, light and darkness and night and day he created. And then he creates the sky and then the land and the sea and the plants and the trees. That's just how I remember it. Okay. And then the sun and moon and stars. So he formed it and then he fills it. It said it was empty, so it needs to be filled. So then he starts to fill it. He fills it first with fish and birds. That's how every time, sorry guys, every time I remember it, I have to say fish and birds. That's how I memorize the days of creation because you can't teach the kids the days of creation as a youth pastor if you don't know them yourself. So I was like, oh, land and sea, plant and tree, fish and birds. Um, anyway, and then fish and birds. See, there it goes again. And then animals. And then not least, but last, on purpose, was human beings. The very last thing, the pinnacle of all his creation. Everything was pointing to this. Everything was leading up to this. He creates us. Genesis 1, chapter, 20, chapter 1, verses 26 says then god said let us make man human beings in our image to be like us they will reign over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky the livestock and the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground so god created human beings in his own image and in the image of god he created them male and female he created them he created us in his image the earth and all that it is in it he created and made for us. We were not made for it. I, I love this concept. We look up at the sun and we know it's there. We know that it brings us warmth and it gives us light. The sun never looks down on you and knows that you're here. You were not created for the sun. We were cre the sun was created for us. God's word tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And I believe that we display it. The heavens, when you look around in his creation, you see that the heavens declare God's glory, but you and I have the opportunity, the ability to display his image. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty awesome. That God created everything in the earth, and then he says, I want to put you in it. I want you to enjoy it. You were made in the image of God. God got personal and made us in his image. He didn't need us. He wanted us. Whenever I try and think of why we're on this planet, I think of Acts chapter 17. There's a verse that I, I really love. Uh, I came across a few years ago. And, and Luke writes the book of Acts, and he's talking about Paul, and he's, he's writing what Paul said. So Paul is saying this. He, he's telling people about God, and he said, God created everything. And, and he created human beings, and he, and he created the nations and he put them in certain time periods, in certain places on the earth. And then he says, here is why. So if you've been sleeping, wake up. Wake up, because I'm going to tell you the purpose of why you were created, why God put us on this planet. Here's the purpose. Acts chapter 17, verse 27 tells us, his purpose, God's purpose, was for the nations, for people, for you to seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and exist. This eternal creator, all-powerful God wants a relationship with you and a relationship with me. He wants us to seek him and actually find him. Before the world began, he was thinking of you. And I think this is a humbling truth for us. Who are we that God is mindful of us? Why, why in the world would God, an eternal being who can create anything he wants, create you? Not you, specifically. I mean, you're awesome. Maybe create me. 
because he loves you. He loves me. Oftentimes, in spite of me, he loves us. God is eternal, and I'll just be honest, I can't fully comprehend it or understand it. His thoughts are greater than my thoughts. His ways are greater than my ways, but he is eternal. And if he were small enough to be completely understood, I I don't believe he would be big enough for our worship. He's creator. He, He created this world. Look around you. It's incredible. Be amazed. Be excited and enjoy his creation. God is powerful, and I, and I know from this one verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that, that he is powerful, and that should speak into my life today. There's got to be someone in the room today that's not having a great week, maybe a great month, maybe already you haven't had a great year. And you're wondering, like, why am I here? Like, is there a real purpose to life? Yeah. God. But can he help me? Yeah. He spoke the world into motion. He created this universe. And he can step into this universe and step into your life and make an impact and make a change. He is powerful, God. And he's a personal God. I mean, that's why he created. He created, and at the pinnacle of his creation, he said, human beings in our image. Why? Because I love them. I want a relationship with them. You were created to seek God and to find God. And I believe that that you were created. God gave you life and the best life you can have. And the only life worth living is one in a relationship with God. And John 1 says that God created everything through Jesus. And it's also true that a relationship with God comes through Jesus. That Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross for his creation, you and me. And then he came back to life so that we could have life through him. So so we stand, we stand in awe today of an eternal creator, powerful God who loves us and wants a personal relationship with us. And as I was going through this, there there are times, I don't know if you've had this, where where you're reading the Bible or maybe you're hearing a message and and God just like nudges at your heart with something. And sometimes it's not even what that weird short guy on the stage said. Uh, Has that ever happened to you? We're like, he was talking about creation, but God was saying something else to me. And it was good, and it was impactful, and it was exactly what I needed to hear. And so as I was preparing this message, uh, God God threw this last little thing at me, and I feel like I should say it because maybe he wanted me to say it to you guys, but this was was something I needed to hear. He didn't like audibly speak it. That would have been cool, though. You guys would think I was cooler if he spoke to me audibly. Dear Chase, Here's what I got. I I was preparing this and reading through this and doing all this stuff. I was like, I think that's good stuff. That verse is so powerful. And then God said, hey, don't forget this. I'm worth it. God is worth it? I was like, maybe I should write a fifth truth. God is worth it. You know, it would fit my theme. He's like, no, it doesn't belong in the bulletin. So I didn't put it in there. But, But God is worth it. What God wanted me to be reminded of that I needed in my own life, that God is worth it. He is worth giving your life for. God is worth stepping out of your comfort zone. What I needed to hear personally was God is worth telling other people about him. You say, Chase, that's your job, to tell people about Jesus. Yeah, here on the stage. But you know, I have neighbors. And I go to the same restaurant often enough that people might know me there. And there's people that God has placed in my life, and he was saying, I'm worth it. Tell somebody about me. I'm worth you going through suffering and pain and sorrow for for my namesake, for glory. I'm worth it, Chase. And maybe he's saying that for you today. He's worth it, giving up something for him. He's worth giving your life up to him. He's worth following him. He's worth it. He is an eternal creator, powerful God that wants a personal relationship with you. Man, the creator of the universe cares about you. That's pretty cool. So I hope that today you walk out of here maybe a little bit encouraged to live for him because I believe he's worth it. We, we often go from the word into worship. We, we open God's word and then we like to close with a little song where we can give back glory to God. 
See, the heavens declare the glory of God and we display it. We are made in his image. I think at times it's good for us to join in and sing and give praise back to this eternal creator, powerful, awesome, glorious, personal God. So would you stand with me and I'll pray and then we'll sing. God, you are so good. Man. Your word is is so powerful. From one little verse, there's so much we can take out of it. Lord, my prayer is that whatever someone needed to hear today, they heard. And I pray that we don't just walk out of here and forget what you were speaking to us. Forget what, what we heard. Forget what we needed to put into practice. But Lord, we will walk out of here changed, encouraged, inspired, reminded that you are worth it. Let your truth from your word impact our lives every day. May we memorize these words, but may we also remember the power that is packed within them. And so we, we praise you. And it's in the name of the powerful, almighty, glorious, wonderful, eternal creator, powerful, personal, name of Jesus that we pray.